Michael Chang was a great, fascinating player of the modern era. One of the most remarkable achievements in tennis history was his victory at the French Open as a 17-year-old. At times, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the world's best. Let's see how good Michael Chang truly was. Michael had been breaking records since he was 12 years old. At the age of 12, he won his first national title, the USTA Junior Hardcourt Singles, and he won the Fiesta Bowl 16s when he was 13 years old. Could you believe that? Well, that was not all. Two years later, 15-year-old Chang was already raising eyebrows in American tennis. He became the youngest winner of the US boys' 18 singles titles in 1987, at the age of 15 years and 5 months. This success was largely due to his father, his first coach, and a self-taught player who had taken up the game two years after Chang was born. His boys' title in 1987 earned him a spot in the US Championships, where he defeated Paul Nakami. Chang turned professional in 1988 and travelled to Paris, where he was overawed and humiliated by McEnroe. He, however, had Henry Leconte on the ropes for two spectacular sets at Wimbledon, and at Flushing Meadow, he beat Jonas Svensson and came from behind to win two consecutive five-set matches and advanced to the last 16 where he was stopped by Andre Agassi. Well, none of this prepared fans for what happened in Paris in 1989. Chang would go on to set another record by becoming the youngest male player to win a Grand Slam tournament. He had been a professional for less than a year and had only competed in four Grand Slam events, but he came from behind to defeat the first and third seeds, Ivan Lendl in the round of 16 and Stefan Edberg in the final. Chang's most famous match, the Lendl match, lasted 4 hours and 39 minutes, while the final lasted 3 hours and 41 minutes. At the risk of being overly simplistic, one could argue that Lendl was outwitted and Edberg outlasted. Lendl did not take enough tactical risks. He appeared to believe that if he continued to pound away from the baseline, Chang would eventually become too tired and inexperienced to do anything but lose. Chang got tired, but only in the legs. And Lendl was not cute enough to capitalize on obvious signs of cramps. When it came down to it mentally, Chang was the sharper of the two. Chang surprised Lendl with an underarm serve at 4-3 and 15-30 in the fifth set, leaving Lendl embarrassingly exposed at the net. Lendl missed his first service at 3-5 and 15-40, and Chang wobbled forward on rubber light legs to receive the second ball while standing between the baseline and service line. Chang's two ploys were legitimate tests of Lendl's alertness, nerves, and technical resilience, and the ever-pragmatic Lendl had no complaints. The final, on the other hand, was shorter because Ed Berg's four-court game abbreviated the rallies, one way or the other. It was a classic final, a model contrast between an elegant and crafty baseliner facing off against a service and volley specialist. Chang cannot be dismissed as merely a baseline player. That was his game's foundation, but he was more versatile and assertive than the likes of Bjorn Borg, Guillermo Vias, Mats Willander, and Lendl. Chang didn't have Sampras' serve, Agassi's return, McEnroe's volley, or Connor's personality. Lendl once told him, You've got no serve, and you've certainly got no second serve. You have a lot of balls, but you have absolutely nothing you can hurt me with. You can run, but you better develop a weapon to survive out here. These were all weaknesses that Chang worked to improve, and it was obvious when he defeated Lendl. Chang certainly had the balls, and in 1989, he was young and dumb enough to think that was enough. His ground strokes were excellent, whether going cross-court or down the line. Chang's outstanding qualities were found in his brain and legs. He was constantly thinking and never missed a beat. His quick anticipation and strong legs allowed him to parry most thrusts until his opponent made a mistake or provided him with the opportunity for a telling riposte, a passing shot or lob or sudden acceleration of pace. Everything Chang did was logical and he exhibited an instinctive flair for reading his opponent's game and making split-second decisions. He once shared his thoughts on how smaller players could slay on the tennis courts, using himself as an example. He revealed that he didn't think a smaller player had a disadvantage in tennis. Chang felt smaller players might not be able to hit as hard or serve as big, but tennis was not all about that. According to Chang, being one of the smaller players on tour meant there were always ways to beat the bigger players, and being smaller and quicker had its advantages. He explained that smaller players need to be able to play different styles because it keeps bigger players off balance and guessing. He also explained that he could have adapted to this current era as well just because the same questions were asked of him when he first played on tour. Chang would get plenty of comments regarding his height, with people saying he was too small, his serve wasn't big enough, or he didn't have enough weapons. But he didn't care, he knew where his strengths lie, and he would never listen to what other people thought he could or could not do. 
According to him, if he had listened to people, he would never even turn pro. Michael Chang and Pete Sampras were among the great American tennis players who emerged in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Andre Agassi and Jim Courier were among those on the list. They all won Grand Slam titles and dominated men's tennis for the better part of the 90s. The US is still waiting for the next generation of tennis players. Unfortunately, it has not arrived yet. What remains is their legacy of classic matches, and Sampras and Chang did not disappoint. During their rivalry, they had their fair share of classic matches. Chang and Sampras met 20 times in total, with Pete leading the rivalry 12-8. That's an impressive record against Pete Sampras, considering the fact that Sampras won 14 majors and was world number one six years in a row in the 90s. The fact that this rivalry was so close demonstrates how good Michael Chang was in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Imagine going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pete Sampras. Here are some interesting stats regarding their rivalry. Michael Chang won the first five games against Pete, which is incredible. This included a complete demolition of Pete in the second round of the 1989 French Open, in which he won 6-1, 6-1, 6-1. Pete would have the upper hand in Grand Slams, they met five times in total. Chang never won against Pete in a Grand Slam match after winning the French Open. They faced off in one Grand Slam final, which it was at the 1996 US Open. In straight sets, Pete won easily 6-1, 6-4, 7-6. They only met on clay once more after the 1989 French Open, and it was in the round of 16 at the 98 ATP Masters in Rome, where Chang won the match 6-2, 7-6. It would have been interesting to see Chang and Sampras compete on clay courts more often. One gets the impression that Chang would have won more matches if they had met later in the 1990s when Sampras was not performing well on the court. Another player who had a deep rivalry with Michael Chang is Stefan Edberg. Between the 1980s and 90s, Michael Chang and Stefan Edberg had a pretty deep rivalry. Most people will remember them for one of the most iconic Grand Slam finals of all time, the 1989 French Open. Michael Chang, then 17, entered the French Open as the 15th seed and worked his way through the draw, famously defeating Ivan Lendl in the round of 16 after being down two sets. In the final, he came from behind again to defeat the number three seed Stefan Edberg, but this time he came back from two sets down to win his first and only Grand Slam. Although many fans remember this match, just a few fans recall that these two would go on to play 31 times during their careers, with Edberg leading the rivalry 12-8. If you ask me, that's a pretty competitive rivalry. Although Chang does not have the Grand Slam numbers that Edberg does, Chang was a consistent top 10 player who routinely defeated former number ones like Sampras, Lendl, and Agassi in major tournaments, particularly on hard courts. Edberg and Chang would compete in four tournament finals in total, and Chang delivered wonderfully precocious deadpan performances against Lendl and Edberg in turn. Chang was raised on hard courts, but only excelled on clay, as he did in the 1989 French Open. He grew stronger as the tournaments passed, but was very unlikely to get much taller. Fans were never quite optimistic about his chances of gaining the power to win major titles on the faster surfaces, but he built a big reputation on small foundations like Willander and Boris Becker, who also won Grand Slam titles at the age of 17. His place in tennis history is, however, already unique, which must be reassuring for a God-fearing young angler who hooked a couple of monster fishes while he was still settling in on the bank. Enjoyed this video? Check out this video about Chang's family.